Good evening, everybody. Um, this is a public event of the South African Drug Policy Week. And um, I'm just seeing here, we don't have any water up here. Uh, is the canteen open? No, probably not, eh? Ew. Thank you, Sonia. Um, very kind of you. Um, right, okay. So, this is the pub first public event of the South African Drug Policy Week. And um, I'm the organizer of the South African Drug Policy Week. My name's Sean Shelley. I work with an organization called TBHIV Care and with the Department of Family uh, Medicine at the University of Pretoria. Um, and I thought that, that the speakers we had at the Drug Policy Week were just so great, we couldn't not have a public forum. And so this is an opportunity for the public and um, uh, some of the people who are at the, at the conference to engage with the speakers in a slightly different way. So, so we're going to be very informal. It's going to be like a, like a chat show, I suppose. We're going to have the opportunity for questions. We're going to have the opportunity for prizes. Um, David, your books are on their way. Ne Ethan, your books demand such a high price, we could not possibly afford them. <laughs> um, and Neil, being a bestseller, your book was available here as well. So we, we managed to get a couple of copies. Uh, so we're going to take it uh, you know, as a casual conversation. Um, we, we hopefully are going to get into a little bit of a robust debate at times. Um, we might introduce a mystery fourth speaker over there, uh, depending whether these guys, you know, whether they get excited and they, they are exciting, or if they get too boring, then we'll have to bring somebody else on. But um, you haven't disappointed yet. All right. So the way, the format we're going to use is we're going to start off with uh, each of the speakers will introduce themselves. I'll ask them a couple of questions initially. Um, and I think this evening, let's start with somebody that um, I... Is, is kind of a hero to me. Well, actually, all three of them are heroes to me in different ways, and you'll hear why. But Professor David Nutt, um, when a friend of mine said she was going to be working in his lab, I got really excited. I thought, wow, can you imagine working with David Nutt? And I've used his uh, multi-criteria decision analysis uh, on the harms of drugs. Is that right, multi? Okay. Um, so many times in presentations and in uh, arguments to people about the relative dangers of drugs. And so I was very privileged to receive uh, David's book in the post and I read it from cover to cover one night and uh, I was very pleased to meet him a, a bit later at Imperial College in London. David, it's a great honor to have you here in South Africa. Thank you for being here. Uh, David's also here for the, for the trial of the plant, the Dacher couple trial up in, in Johannesburg. But uh, let, me, let, you, let me let you introduce yourself rather than, than rabbit on. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here, and, uh, and thanks for the invite. And it's, it's also going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, in the court case in Pretoria over the next few weeks. So I'm staying here for two weeks as... Uh, to, as an expert witness in that case. But uh, thinking just a little bit more about why I'm here and what I am. Well, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, as I like to say to people with a name like Nut, you know. There are just a couple of jobs in medicine and the brain is much more interesting than the other organ with the same name. And um, <laughs> you got it. Good, good. good. <laughs> uh, uh, the rest will laugh tomorrow. And I'm a psychopharmacologist, so I'm very interested in uh, drugs which affect the brain. Uh, and I've worked on a whole range of drugs. In fact, there's probably no drug that's prescribed for psych in psychiatric practice. I haven't actually done some research on. So everything from lithium through to benzodiazepines and, and opiates. But uh, as a result of being interested in pharmacology, uh, I, about 20 years ago, got collared into thinking about the other side of pharmacology, i.e. the use of drugs for recreational purposes and drug dependence. And uh, my career started actually uh, in the US because I was uh, made the head of the 
uh, inpatient research unit in the Alcohol Institute in the National Institute of Health. Uh, and uh, I spent two years there, and it was, it was a fascinating experience because uh, it taught me an enormous amount about the problems of alcohol and alcohol dependence. And, uh, and it got me thinking about the whole challenge of how we deal with people who, who can't stop drinking and who, who, but who can detoxify, you can get into absence, but then can continue to relapse. And I started there thinking about relapse prevention agents. And I've been working on that ever since. Not very successfully, because we haven't got one yet. But we know at least how to study them, which is something. And then I came back to the UK to run a psychopharmacology unit. And because I had, you know, I could spell pharmacology, unlike most psychiatrists. <laughs> uh, eventually, I was brought in to advise uh, expert committees on the harms of drugs. Uh, and uh, eventually got sucked into a government role uh, trying to assess the comparative harms of drugs and to monitor how the development of, uh, of the drug space was coming on, the, uh, the emergence of new drugs like ketamine and GHB. Uh, and, uh, and that was a, uh, an interesting experience. I worked as a, a kind of senior uh, advisor to the government's expert committee on drugs for nine years. Uh, and I, as I, when I started doing that, I realized that there was absolutely no structure to the way that committee was making decisions. And in fact, the terms that I, uh, of my appointment to that committee, as chair of that committee, were that I would be allowed to develop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Did Thank I, you. I, at the terms of, uh, I, I insisted that if I was to take on this role, I would have to be allowed to work with the other experts and also the, the um, civil servants to develop a rational policy. You know, it, it's not acceptable for, for a decision uh, on the classification of a drug to be made arbitrarily because the consequences for, for people who use those drugs uh, can be enormous. Uh, you know, the penalties change greatly from whether in the UK a drug is a class A, class B or class C. And of course, a decision to make a drug illegal at all has huge implications on anyone who's caught using it. And also has huge implications on research, which is something I'll come to at the end. And I was allowed to do that. And in fact, there was quite a lot of encouragement at the time because we were going through a period of, uh, of relative sanity in our um, government. We had a prime minister called... Uh, called Tony Blair, who actually at the time, he was quite a, a, a progressive, thoughtful man. It all fell apart, of course, when he got into bed with a, some American called Bush, but that's another story. Mm. But, but at that time, there was optimism, and uh, people wanted to use science, they wanted to have evidence-based policies, and we developed a way of assessing the harms of drugs. Uh, we, in fact, we developed several iterations to, to we got to the point of this technology which we now use today called multi-criteria decision analysis, which is the most powerful way of evaluating any kind of complex question there is. The problem was that when you apply rationality to a, a system of drug classification that has been has grown in a sort of random way for the last hundred years, you find there are anomalies. Well, in fact, it's very different. In fact, it's all, almost all an anomaly. There's, there's very little uh, evidence underpinning the way in which the current United Nations policies or the British poli policies or the American policies and the uh, South African policies are built. They're not evidence-based. Now, to me, that was great. Okay, so now we know what's wrong and we know how to fix it. Uh, but there's a, a challenge in fixing things. You have to have people wanting to fix them. And, and that's where things got difficult because, uh, again, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, but are largely political, uh, the atmosphere, the mood in Britain changed and governments were less interested in evidence and more interested in staying in power. And drugs, as I'm sure Ethan will explain in a minute, drugs are a very useful political tool. And the drug laws are, 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 are very powerful ways of creating uh, a narrative which can encourage people to vote for you if, if you have make the right noises. So my attempts to bring a, a rational approach to drugs failed. Um, and it, it didn't stop me, uh, because I 
carried on pushing the government. Um, but in the end, they got fed up with being pushed, so they sacked me. So uh, that was the end of that. And in fact, the policy, if anything, has gone quite a bit backwards since then. But uh, one thing about being sacked from government is it, it, you do get some publicity. And one of the things actually was was interesting at the time because I was sacked in 2009. And it was really the beginning of the internet age and the beginning of social media. And the uh, un injustice uh, of my sacking and the, the reasons for it became quite a cause celebre in terms of the, the social media. I got enormous amount of support through the internet from other scientists and vast numbers of, of people following me on, on uh, Facebook as it was then and now Twitter. Because the majority of people would actually like to have policies which are evidence-based and also just and uh, it's particularly young people. So, so the sack my sacking generated a debate which has continued to this day. And I guess if I hadn't been sacked, you'd probably never heard of me because I wouldn't have had the time to write the book. I wouldn't have sold the books. You wouldn't have read the book. So in this peculiar way, um, the, the oxygen of publicity of my dismissal has actually led to a, real, a much greater uh, debate in the UK and uh, hopefully internationally. Yeah. And I'm here to help you any way I can. And uh, I'm hoping that... Um, to come back, I, I would very much like to do uh, an MCDA uh, across mm. South Africa, you looking at the drugs which are important to you as a way, hopefully, of helping you modify and develop and improve your drug policies. So thanks for having me now, and please invite me back. Yeah. Thank you, David, um, for that introduction. Um, after David, we're going to go across to Neil in a moment, but, but um, and, and then come to Ethan, and there's a reason for that. But, but there, just, just one thing uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I spoke with the uh, MCC today and uh, some other people, and they are talking about funding uh, multicultural analysis. Oh, good. Analysis. Excellent. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and the good news is I'm free. Yeah. Well, I just need an airfare. Do you, do you, oh, you meant free that you've got time, or free that you, or both? <laughs> Well, I'm getting old, so I can always find time. <laughs> yes, okay. All right. Um, so, so the question I've got to you is, is often when it comes to drug policy and that, the, the thing of, of what about the children always comes up. And when I read your book, you've got a chapter in the book for advice on how to speak to your kids about drugs. And, and I personally found it to be the most helpful chapter I've read in any book about how to speak to your kids about drugs. And um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Because, because everybody thinks, what about the children? Well, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, really, isn't it? It's, it's tell them the truth. Because if you don't tell your kids the truth, <laughs> they know you're lying. <laughs> I mean, they're smarter than you are. And, and one thing's for sure, they, they know more about drugs than you do. <laughs> so I remember talking to one of my kids once, saying, well, you know, there's this big concern about, you know, ecstasy and, you know... I hope you're going to, you know, not be doing what your mates are doing when you go out to this rave. He said, Dad, he said, Dad, it's much safer than alcohol. I know that. You know that. Go and check, <laughs> go and check your facts. All right, son. All right. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, right, let's start from the beginning. Let's <laughs> so, so I think the secret is to tell the kids the truth and educate them. But the, that has to start very early on. Mm. I'm really conscious of the fact that Probably up to 15% of children in this country have parents who are harming their children through the use of drugs, largely alcohol, to some extent tobacco, but also other drugs. And, and we need to make sure that there's, there are support systems for those children as soon as they understand that they're getting beaten up by their drunk dad or their m mother getting beaten up by their drunk dad is wrong. So they, we need to explain to children from the age of three or four that, 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 that drugs change the way people think uh, and that a lot of the, lot of the media, uh, particularly um, encouraging the use of alcohol, is wrong. And we need to empower them to ask questions about the damage that drugs are doing in, in their families. And that's the starting point then to have a rational discussion because once you start talking about alcohol, you can then start to talk about other drugs as they gradually get older and, and, and understand them more. Uh, and w one of the other things I've learned is that um, knowledge is actually quite boring. Because 
I think when people know about drugs, they're much less interested in them than when they're wondering if they're some fanciful, some, some supernatural, some special phenomenon. So, so at the very least, um, it, uh, it, real knowledge as opposed to sort of just information which is incorrect can actually help people make s rational decisions about drug use. And then the other thing I would say to them always is, in, you, know, you know, if you're going to use drugs, well, do it as safely as you can, and that's not easy in the current, most current countries where you don't know what you're taking often. Yeah. But the other really important thing is never get caught. Yeah. Because the penalties for drug possession are al almost always more detrimental to the child's development than the drugs they use. And that is the iniquity. And again, I, I think Ethan will probably talk about that. So they, people, the children need to understand the, the big picture and are as far as possible. Thank you. The, uh, I agree with you fully. Um, we were at a family dinner a little while ago and uh, I asked, uh, there was a 16-year-old who was interested in experimenting with cannabis and I asked him, what is the most dangerous thing about cannabis? And we went on and on and on. And eventually my answer was the possibility of getting caught. And, uh, and I would agree with that firmly. Uh, so let's move to a man who is the person who might get us caught. Now, um, Neil is an interesting guy for me because I read a piece in Vice, which is, was an extract from his book, okay? It's a very good book, by the way. Um, good Cop, Bad War. And I actually used it in an academic paper with uh, Prof. Marx and uh, Simon Howell, and uh, we quoted Neil Woods on uh, some of the, the work he did. And then a while later, um, I was in London, and funny enough, the same evening that I met uh, Ethan, um, and being a person who did a 10-year embedded ethnographic survey into the drug economy in South Africa, I kind of check out the scene when I walk into a room. And I walked into the room and I looked and I said, who is the guy that I would score from in this room? There he is. I still got it. You still got it. I was horrified to find out that this was the man that I'd quoted in, 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 in our paper on police culture, of all things. Neil Wood, and, and uh, your book's a ripper. It's fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how come it's, it's an it's a undercover narcotics agent who is now leading law enforcement action partnership, is it? But just to give you an idea, it used to be called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition in the UK. Tell us about that journey. Well, I mean, it, it was quite a long journey. Um, when I went into the police, I uh, dropped out of university and um, I thought, what am I going to do? And I, I was going to go backpacking around Europe like peak dropouts normally do. Um, but then I saw an advertisement in the newspaper for the police and I thought that would be an adventure. Um, so I couldn't make a mind of which one to do, so I flipped a coin, and it came up heads, and so I went into the police. As one does. As one does, yeah, you know, <laughs> you've, got to be, you've got to be flippant about these things, I think. Yeah. So, but one, once I went into the police, though, I, I, I found myself <laughs> wanting to uh, do the right thing, almost in a boy's own type of style, you know, based on mm -hmm. the sort of literature I used to read. Um, you know, I quickly got duty-bound. But I wasn't actually that good at the job at all. If I didn't deal with confrontation very well. But I hung on with the, the skin in my teeth. And eventually I got the opportunity to work with the drug squad. And in th this particular form of work hadn't gone on in the UK before. Undercover work, sort of low-level undercover work. And so one, of the, one, one day this drug squad cop said, do you fancy having a go buying some crack cocaine? So I thought, yeah, why not? So he gave <laughs> me 20 quid and I went and knocked on the door had a short conversation, and I came, came away with my 20-pound rock of crack. Now, a few nervous moments, but it wasn't actually that difficult, really. Um, and so that, that defined the next 14 years of my life. Now, just to give some context, when I went into the police, I clearly remembered the face of Nancy Reagan on my TV telling me that one smoke of crack cocaine and you're addicted for life. I was completely bought into... <laughs> This, this idea that we must fight drugs with all of our energy and that they are the, the most evil scourge of society. And, and so when I was initially meeting up with people who had got problems with drugs, 
I saw them with, in a very conservative way that they are people who'd made a mistake in life because they shouldn't have bothered trying it. And they'd just not got the willpower to get themselves out of it. So that was, that's their bad luck. And, th and that is how harshly I, I saw the people in which I, I found myself moving. Um, I was a product of my society and the tabloid newspapers, I, I, I would say. But in order to become better at undercover work, you have to understand people as much as possible. And so that's when I started em empathising with people. So, that, I mean, there's, there's, it, took, it took me a long time, though, to, to, to do a 180-degree turn. I mean, it took, me, it took me a long time for the penny to drop. But there's, there's, there's various instances along the way which contributed to my 180-degree turn, really. In fact, shall I, shall I tell you a little story? One of the, sure. One of, one of the moments... That we, really that's what we're waiting for. One, one, of, the, one of the moments that really st um, sticks in my mind. So, as an undercover cop, I was starting from the ground level. It was pretty grimy work, really. And basically, what I was trying to do was to get introductions to gangsters and then try and work my way up to a sort of regional... Um, regional boss or some, someone in charge of an area. Um, so I would do that by buying bigger weights and by the legend that I was particularly using. Sometimes I would play a travelling scally. You don't have that word, do you? Scally. No, no, no. um, travelling criminal, travelling burglar, um, selling stolen property to people, that kind of thing. But more often than not, the most effective way I found to actually build up a legend was to actually put myself at as the lowest pitch possible. So I would be sort of dressed virtually homeless, sort of looking, because I found quite quickly that the more vulnerable people were, the more easy they were to manipulate. So the most easy people to manipulate were people who were really struggling with real serious uh, drug problems, homeless, those kind of people. They were the easiest ones to, to take advantage of. So for this particular operation in, in Nottingham, I was really, really dressed down. I mean, I, I, was, I was really scruffy and I was, I was cultivating myself. At the end of the day, I was taking my clothes off and wrapping them in a plastic bag and really letting them fester. So, so when I was, one, one day when I was being dropped off by two colleagues, they were, they were swearing at me, saying I was making their car smell and they were winding the window down saying, you dirty bastard, what are you doing with my car? This smells. And so they, they you know, Normal sort of police, ban police banter, really. But, um, but it was true. It was true. I'd, I looked a real mess. So this day, I, I was arranging to meet a particular gangster who I'd been buying uh, some decent weights of heroin from. And for some reason, this day, he said, meet me at the other end of um, this road in, in Nottingham. And he was going to meet me in a taxi. Apparently, he was being driven around in a taxi all day. So as I started walking along this road, which is um, just on the edge of... Uh, the red light area in Nottingham. And this was half past one on a sunny afternoon. And bearing in mind, I'm looking really, really rough. So as I'm walking along, it's this little very long curved road, and I hear this voice. It says, sex for sale. And I thought to myself, well, I know I'm on the edge of the red light area, but this is half past one in, in the afternoon. Even for Nottingham, that's fairly brazen. <laughs> So I, so I carried on walking, and there's still a bend in the road, and I hear this voice shouting again, sex for sale. I thought, I can't see anyone yet, and I carried on walking. I heard it again, sex for sale. Anyway, as, I, as I'm walking along, I finally see this, this young lady, and she's leaning against the wall just around the apex of, of the road. And as I'm walking towards her, she looks me up and down appraisingly, and she says, cheap. Sex for sale? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I walked past. I, was, I, was, I have to say, I was a little lost for words, if I'm honest. <laughs> and I, and, I, and I, I carried on walking. Anyway, I got to the end of the road, and uh, I met the gangster. Yeah, and he, well, he was being driven around in a taxi all day. I bought, um, I bought a couple of uh, point fours, about 40 pounds worth of heroin. Can't remember what the gangster looks like, actually. But when I got back, at uh, the end of the day, lots more drug buying and networking. And I told the rest of the team what had happened. And they, they all laughed, like, like you've, you've all just laughed. And then over the years, I've, I've told that story to train other undercover police or, or just general drugs training for, for officers and other outside agencies. 
And wherever I go, everyone laughs. Mm. Now, I look back on that, and as I say, I cannot remember what the gangster looks like. Yeah. I have no idea. But her face is absolutely etched on my memory. Absolutely. Because she wasn't a day over 20, of that I'm sure, and she was clutching a can of um, super strong uh, lager, special brew, which is 8.5% pure. And she was shaking, and she was sweating, and she was drinking that lager, desperately trying to fend off the withdrawal from heroin. And I can see her absolutely clearly, and this is 13 years ago. And because I look back and I think, I was walking past her, and I was the representative of the state. And all of the money and the, the, the resources that were gone in, going into the operation, the things that I was doing, and I was walking past somebody who desperately, desperately needed help. Because I guarantee, at the age of 12, 13, 14, that wasn't her ambition. Now, that's one of the things that made me realise I have to fight to change things. Because w why would we walk past someone who was being sexually exploited? And she was being sexually exploited. That's not prostitution, it's sexual exploitation. And it's not difficult to change policy, to rescue people from sexual exploitation. It's not. Because if the state prescribed her heroin, she wouldn't be there. It, mm. is, it sounds simple, because it is that simple. And so that, that's one of the, so I mean, um, that's one of the reasons. I, I still, to be honest, it took me years afterwards to reflect on all that. I didn't, I didn't suddenly make, make that realisation. All of these things sort of built up over time. But, but for me, that's one of the most important um, memories to me that, that helped shape the way I view things today. Thanks, Neil. Um, the question that, that often comes to my mind, and I'm sure comes to lots of other people's minds, especially after watching these films, did you ever have to use drugs as an undercover police officer? Um, I, I thankfully never had to use heroin uh, or crack. I mean, crack wouldn't particularly worry me, uh, but her heroin, obviously, a scary substance. I had a few scary moments, but to be honest, the, the way that gangsters prefer to deal mm. makes it quite difficult for them to suddenly say to you, I want to see you do it. Mm. And... You just have th as, as long as you understand the commodity and you understand and you can come up with feasible reasons why not. Um, I talked my way out of it a few times. I did have to use cannabis a few times, but you know, it's just does cannabis. Mm. Um, uh, but but once I made I made a drastic mistake of uh, making myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines. Mm. You know, people don't want to talk about music. So you've got to talk about something else. Mm. And so, you know, you, I built my legend. And of course, I didn't have a clue at all. Mm. I, didn't I wasn't really a connoisseur. And so one day, this particular guy, and, and he, was a, he was a very, very vicious gangster. He was dealing in stolen antiques. I was buying stolen cars from him. And he brought me a present one day. And he, so he held, he, and, I, and I'd just seen him direct somebody else to, uh, to, to have someone beaten up over a £10 debt. So I was under no illusions of just how quickly violent this guy could be. And he held, he held up this little plastic bag with this pink toxic goo in it. I could almost see it dissolving the plastic before my eyes. It, it smelt like the urine from a glue-sniffing cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, go nice on image, then. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. <laughs> so, so he said, go on, go on, have some. So I thought, I'm, I'm going to have to have some here. But he picked up that slight bit of ret reticence, and he was instantly suspicious. So I had some on the tip of my little finger. He said, you want more than that? And so he insisted I do some more. And then he, then he was satisfied. But well, it didn't take more than about 15 minutes before I had that warm glow in my stomach. And I was completely out of it within half an hour. Um, Street amphetamine at the time in, in the UK was only about 5% pure. This was 40%. Mm. And I didn't sleep, really, properly for three nights. Mm. It, was, it was absolutely horrendous. I had to be, had to be driven home. Um, uh, mind you, my house has never been so tidy, mm. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, Neil, for that. Okay, that's answer that question. 
Ethan, I, I, I'm building to you. They, but since we're speaking about amphetamines, I am a bit of a, co a connoisseur of amphetamine. Um, and uh, uh, David, uh, there's, there's this, this thing going around. I, I read this article in The Guardian the other day that said um, that, that, that somebody from that uh, fine institution of academic, uh, the pinnacle of academic achievement, Sussex University, um, uh, they don't know Sussex University. Uh, there was a chap in the computer science department who has vehemently come out against these uh, performance enhancing drugs being used in exams, you see. And, and, and so what he wants to do is, is uh, introduce drug testing for amphetamines, Ritalin, uh, modafinil. Uh, that must be quite an expensive test, modafinil, to try and I, I'm not sure you know. Yeah, only, the, only foreign students can afford modafinil. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so um, modafinil, in fact, if you can afford modafinil on a regular basis, you can actually pay somebody to write your exams. Yeah. Um, modafinil, um, you know, these kind of, kind of drugs that they say are giving students unfair advantages, as though, of course, nobody has an advantage anyway. What's your opinion on that? Should we be testing people for, for that? Uh, Let me come to the question of whether we should test it at, at the end. Um, yeah. My opinion is that uh, it's almost impossible to show any benefit for these kind of uh, uh, alertness-promoting drugs like amphetamines or modafinil uh, in any situation except when people are sleep-deprived or when they've got a disorder like ADHD. ADHD. So the average student uh, using, say, Ritalin to work longer uh, is just working at a different time of day to the student who doesn't use Ritalin. So they might work all night, uh, but they will then sleep in the day. And, uh, and, and so there's no, there's no overall benefit. And there's a potential big disbenefit, which is that uh, if you take too much, and it doesn't take, a, you know, doubling the dose is too much. And uh, if you take too much thinking, well, that's got to be twice as good as it'll keep me twice as awake. Uh, that's often a bad thing to do. And I've, I've been consulted on this. I mean, I, I, I'm a psychiatrist. I used to run a clinic for, for people, uh, adults with ADHD. So I've got a lot of experience of prescribing these drugs. And would not uncommonly, probably about once a year, get an email from a parent, a desperate parent, who said, my child's really messed up in their exams <laughs> because they... They topped up too much and then uh, wrote the same answer three times, you know, Rippy. And you get stereotypy, uh, Rippy. You know, people get locked into this house cleaning exercise, which is fine if you're in a house, but, but it's best not to do that when you're trying to do your exam. So actually, it can be very counterproductive. So I'm generally the view that the human brain is, when it's confronted with a challenge like an exam, it, for most of us, it produces the optimal level of arousal. Mm. And, and um, changing that with a stimulant can be quite, uh, quite worrying and dangerous. So personally, I don't think there's a great, uh, there would be a great value in testing people. Um, uh, but then, of course, you know, you see testing occurs in other areas of life. I mean, do why do we test people, uh, sporting people? And that is a that is quite an interesting question. And. To be honest, I think quite a, a lot of the testing we do for sports and then is uh, a kind of proxy for sending a message, an anti-drug message. And I, I might talk this morning, I mentioned Andre Agassi. Uh, I mean, and, you know, his career could have been destroyed uh, if the tennis authorities had pursued their uh, legislation, their own rules about recreational use of drugs. We've seen in Britain many uh, many rugby players, football players have their careers ruined because once they recreationally used a drug like cocaine or even cannabis. Um, yeah, so the arbitrary denial of uh, uh, drugs uh, to sportsmen can be really very... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging question and uh, I think people should be much more open about what, what sports authorities are trying to do. Sure, if you are... You know, if you are do, doing blood doping, um, like you know, Lance Armstrong, multiple times, you know, that is cheating. But on the other hand, the occasional use of a recreational drug should not destroy your career. And we've seen that. We've had footballers um, whose careers have been completely terminated because 
a couple of times they've tested positive for cocaine, yeah. and that seems to me unfair. And I just want to finish with an anecdote. A few, ten years ago, I was approached by uh, a doctor who was the sort of assessor for the... Um, whatever, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what the, what the title of the organisation is, but it's about aerobatics. It's about planes, uh, flying planes in complex manoeuvres to, um, no, to presumably to win trophies. So that, uh, there is an international aerobatic society, and they were debating whether to bring in urine testing for the pilots. And the guy said to me, what do you think? And I thought, well, interesting, what do I think about pilots, you know, being tested for amphetamine when they're loop in the loop and stuff. And so, so I sat down with this guy who was another doctor and I said, well, you know, let's look at the evidence. What, what do we know about this? And we went back and we started exploring the use of uh, amphetamines in pilots during the war. Mm. And we found that uh, it's a very uncertain benefit. Yeah, if you are flying a very long mission, then you can stay awake for longer if you take amphetamines. But on the other hand, you know, you might fly the wrong way. Uh, and uh, and also, there's a, a, it's um, it's certainly by no means the case that you are better mm. when you take amphetamines. And uh, so we ended. I think they decided not to test for them because on the mm. on the grounds that it was almost no one's going to use them, and it <coughs> would would be kind of a waste of money to mm. do it. So it's a complex, a long answer to actually is what is quite a complex question. I, and I, I think the other thing, just to say finally, is it the problem with testing is what you do with the knowledge. That's why I'm against testing at schools, because if testing is simply a way of excluding people, then you end up compounding the problem. It's because it's just another form of prohibition. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm generally yeah. against testing, unless there are some particular benefits. And those will only apply, I think, in, in particular in sports. So everybody tonight has been very cooperative in giving me segues between the different speakers. And, and there you gave me two. It's, uh, the, the, the first is, is uh, the pilot uh, thing, because... Um, there, there are some papers available on the internet, uh, studies done by the American Navy on the naval fighter pilots on um, the, the length. I'm going to go to Ethan. All right, you know uh, uh, This is the segue. Take, uh, take it away. Uh, yeah. So, so um, th there, in, in these papers, they talk a lot about these long flying missions and that kind of thing. And, and America needs these things because they they fight these long wars, uh, you know, virtually all the time. There's a war going on that America's involved in somewhere, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's the first introduction to Ethan, you know, this, this war that's going on in America, we call the war on drugs. And then the other thing is, is, is that thing, it's another way of othering people, of, of, of putting people aside. And I think that if anybody can get the message across um, that this war on drugs is, a, is actually a war on people, it's Ethan Nadelman. You know, Ethan's been the head of the Drug Policy Alliance for a large number of years. We were all very surprised to hear he'd retired recently. I was very fortunate because I, I think that if you hadn't retired, you wouldn't be here today. And uh, I, I'm, I met Ethan in London uh, at the same event where Neil was in the vaults under the... Which station was it? I can't remember. It was under one of those stations in London. Fantastic venue. And I remember being blown away with, with, with your talk. So... I left you to last because I, I would not want to follow you after public speaking. I, I'm sorry, with due respect to, to, to both of the other speakers, I don't think, I, you know, as I said earlier, thank God you don't run a cult <laughs> because I would be joined. Um, Ethan, you, you're free to wander a bit. Uh, if you want to, you can stand, you can sit, you can do, you've, you've got the house for about uh, uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, uh, Tell us a bit about Ethan Edelman and your crusade and, and your war as an American. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sean. <laughs> That's a nice introduction. Um, and I know some of you were, heard me speak last night, so I'm going to try to avoid repeating too much um, uh, uh, while just enough for others who, who weren't there. Um, but, you know, I, I think when I... I mean, I've spent my entire adult life on this issue of drugs and working to, to end this drug war, both in my own country and around the world. And, you know, it's when people ask me, how did I get involved in this? And, I, you know, I say something I, I think was part of it was I grew up in a, a fairly religious family. My, my father was a rabbi. 
And uh, my mom came from a traditional Jewish family, and you know, we we're Sabbath observant. And, and then I went off to college, actually at McGill University in Montreal, growing up in New York. And going off to college, and I remember you know, smoking pot. Actually, it was hash for the first time. And liking it. I mean, and, and, and I like booze too. But what was apparent was that you know, friends were getting busted and we had to be secretive about, about smoking marijuana. And, and it, it, there was just something that seemed odd about it. Like why you go to a bar and there would be people, you know, fights, it was dangerous. You know. But marijuana just seemed, cannabis just seemed like so much less of an issue. And it just kind of, there was something wrong about that. And it was personal because I realized I was a bit vulnerable as somebody who could get busted at the border going home to the U.S. or elsewhere. Um, and then I remember that my, it also my, my sophomore year I was studying politics and, and, and I landed up reading the classic book On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. It's like the classic statement from the mid-19th century on liberty and John Stuart Mill makes a distinction between, you know, where's the proper role of government? Between, uh, and he says, for those activities that are primarily other regarding where you might hurt somebody else, that's where the government has a proper role to basically punish you or try to deter you from engaging in bad behavior that hurts others. But those activities that are primarily self-regarding, right, are basically not the government's business. They may try to dissuade you, but they shouldn't go out, they're punishing you. And I remember this was a, the early years, this was the mid 70s, it was the period of sort of the uh, beginning of debates about homosexuality and how that was gonna be treated. And it seemed to strike me that the same thing was true with marijuana, I don't know about the other drugs back then, but uh, that kind of clicked. Anyway, fast forward a few years in 1980s, and I'm in graduate school, and I'm doing a law degree, I'm doing a PhD in political science, um, and, and um, uh, I'm, I'm not taking my studies very seriously and, and uh, couldn't figure out what I wanted to work on. And some friend of mine said, well, Ethan, you've always been interested in the deviant side of things and all this drugs and crime <laughs> stuff. I was kind of intrigued. So I decided to be, do my PhD dissertation on this issue about international drug control. I was interested in US foreign policy. I was historically inclined. So I said, why the hell not? I, I mean, I really wasn't taking it. Nobody else was working on this area. I figured I'd go work on something that nobody else was working on in the early 80s. And, and then I, I had to do certain things. So I, I wanted to find out how this whole thing worked. And I began reading historically. But I also managed to talk my way into the State Department. <laughs> and the State Department had a narcotics bureau, and I went and I got myself a security clearance, and I worked in the State Department's narcotics bureau, and then I talked my way into the DEA, the U.S. Federal Police, P Drug Police Agency, and, and I began interviewing, you know, DEA guys, guys sort of like Neil, but operating at the federal level, and the ones who were stationed internationally. And so I was at the State Department, I had Interpol connections, I was traveling, I traveled to 17 or 19 countries throughout Europe and Latin America, interviewing DEA guys and foreign drug enforcement agents and customs and FBI and CIA and prosecutors and diplomats. And, and, and already my views on the drug stuff was, this is a little crazy, this whole drug war. Um, but in a way, undercovering the undercover guys. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't telling them what I thought in most cases. Um, but what was striking in traveling around was how incredibly uninformed and, and ignorant people were. I mean, in the State Department, in the law enforcement thing. And I remember going down to, in Latin America, interviewing guys down there, and I say to them, well, what do you think the solution is here? And the guys down in Latin America would say, well, I mean, you're not going to solve it here, we can tell you that. <laughs> the answer lies over there and back home and reducing demand. And then I would go back to the U.S. and I would ask, talk to people in drug treatment and prevention, da da da. You know, and I'd say, well, what do you think the answer is? And they'd say, well, let me tell you something. You're not going to solve the answer over here on the demand side. And you had to cut off the supply. And then I would go talk to the guys like in Customs or Coast Guard working you know, on the interdiction side. And I'd say, well, what do you think the answer is? And they say, well, you're not gonna solve the answer over here at the borders. The answer lies over there, you know, uh, demand, supply. And what you realized was that everybody working in this whole drug control effort thought that the solution lay in the area about which they knew the least, right? 
And it was just kind of eye-opening in this sense that when you knew something, you knew you couldn't solve it there. And then I started reading historically about this stuff, and, and you began to realize, I mean, the more you read, the more you read about the history, the scientific evidence, the economic analysis, the medical side, how countries have dealt with this throughout history, the more you realize that drug control policy should really be much more oriented in that direction as a health problem, right? And yet the politics and the laws of my country and most of the rest of the world were going in this direction because this was the period of Ronald Reagan. And as I'm beginning to finish my dissertation, all of a sudden the drug war is going crazy in the United States. It's 1984, 1986, Congress getting into it, Reagan, Reagan giving Reagan and Nan Ronald and Nancy Reagan giving a national speech in 1986. George Bush comes in. The, the drug issue is the number one big issue in American public opinion. And I was, in a way, fortunate. Because here I decided to start working on my dissertation in this obscure drug area, and all of a sudden it's at the height of national attention. And I write a couple of articles basically saying, you know, this whole drug war, it's crazy. And not many people are saying that back then, right? I remember my first coming out speech 30 years ago. There's a college at, it's at the Defense, in Co Defense Intelligence College at Fort Bowling Air Force Base. Right? In front of 200 intelligence analysts from the CIA, the De DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, the State Department, all these others. I'm on a panel with like the head of the State Department's drug policy, the DEA's number two guy, my, you know, the head of the Marine Corps' drug interdiction unit, my dissertation advisor at Harvard who did not agree with me. You know, and at the very end, I stand up at this thing. I've almost never done any public speaking. And I say, I just have to tell you all something. You know, you're basically no different than the prohibition agents during alcohol prohibition. And in fact, you're not gonna succeed. You can't keep this stuff out of the country where there's a demand is gonna be supplied. You're just making things worse. In the same way that alcohol prohibition generated Al Capone and violence and crime and corruption and, and fill overflowing prison cells and, and adulterated drugs killing people and disrespect for law and order and all of the hypocrisy and degradation. That's what you guys are involved in right now. People started hooting at me. I mean, these you know, people start, who invited him? The other guys in the panel are pushing away from me, you know? I mean, it, it was, and I have to say, after that coming out speech, everything's been easy since. <laughs> because it was just a you know, hostile life. But, so anyway, I mean, for me, for me, you know, what it was was I began, I sort of wrote this stuff out there as an academic. I'd started teaching at Princeton. I had this, you know, Ivy League you know, professorship, you know, I had a good podium. And some other people were stepping out, some famous conservatives like the economist mm. Milton Friedman and William Buckley, the conservative intellectual. There was a mayor from Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, who had, you know, uh, you know, Yale, Harvard Law School, Rhodes Scholar, uh, African-American guy, chief prosecutor of Baltimore, you know, then becomes mayor. And he, he's, he is, what transforms him, a different version of Neil's story, was listening to an undercover operation that had gone bad, where an undercover guy had been killed, and they had the audio tape because he was wearing a wire. And for Kurt Schmoke, the mayor, it was like, why, why do we sacrifice this guy's life? Why? Did anything that this guy did, no matter how big a thing he scored, was that actually going to have any difference in terms of reducing drug abuse, drug addiction, anything like that? Was it gonna do anything? And if they knocked out that drug dealer, wasn't he just gonna be replaced by somebody else and then by somebody else and somebody else? In fact, you know, the more you knocked out, the more job opportunities you created for new people coming up. And so I think it was by, you know, the late 80s, I was still in academia, but it kind of dawned on me that really this was kind of be my calling in life. Mm. And that, 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 that my calling was going to be to teach about this issue of drugs, about drugs and drug policy and the drug war, and that this was also a vehicle for talking about broader issues in our society, right? That basically, the more I looked deeply and deeply at the drug war, it more it struck me as resembling crusades. You know, where we're going to take Jerusalem and it doesn't matter if everybody dies, but we're going to take it. <laughs>
right? You know, it's reminding me, you know, I grew up with a very strong sense of, of, of Jewish identity, historical Jewish identity. My dad had been born in Berlin. His family had, had to flee. His father had won the Iron Cross for Germany in the First World War and then been killed in Auschwitz in the Second World War. I was very conscious of sort of, you know, oppression. I was very conscious of, of the links between oppression of Jews and links between, you know, oppression of, of, of black people in my own country or of gay people or other demonized minorities. You know, there was a, 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 a liberty Libertarian psychiatrist Thomas Sass, who had written a book called *The Ceremonial Chemistry* about the ritual persecution of witches and and drug addicts and other demonized minorities, and it struck me that in many respects, what was going on with drug users and drug addicts in my own country and around much of the world was remarkably similar to the ritual persecution of riches. You know, women who were mentally ill or strange and were you know burned at the stake, or of gay people, or black people, or or Jews, or whatever. And so that part hit me, and it seemed like, well, I mean, this is about a true moral struggle, you know? And this was a period in American history where, you know, so the civil rights clause had pointed to it where we had formal legal equality between black and white. You still had cultural, you know, racism, but we didn't have legal racism in the same way, where women's rights were more or less equal, once again, at the legal level, even if it wasn't quite culturally, where gay rights, I mean, I, I think maybe if I'd been gay, that cause might have drawn me in, but I mean, it was beginning to make progress. But as somebody who was a... a, a, a you know, I had continued to smoke marijuana. I, I have for the last 42 years of my life. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's been a net plus in my life. And I've never been really a daily consumer, but I found it, I, I like marijuana a lot. And actually mushrooms. I like mushrooms too. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, for, for me, mushrooms, uh, I mean, mushrooms were really, the, what I say about mushrooms is, is, you know, I think they're wasted on the young. Because, <laughs> um, you know, when, when you're young and you do mushrooms, what do you do? You know, all go swimming, you look at the water coming out, you know, or the visuals and stuff. But I mean, I actually think, in a, in a way, I, I sometimes think that with mushrooms is something that people should continue to do as they age. You know, I mean, I'm still, I'm not really traditionally Jewish anymore, but I still observe key holidays, you know, and Jews, on, once a year on Yom Kippur, we fast, a 25-hour fast, no food, no water, and I think it's kind of good for the soul, you know, it kind of, you know, it gets you into that altered state, you get to meditate on things in a, in a communal environment, and I think, that's what I think about mushrooms, right? Once a year, go out and do mushrooms, it's good for stirring up the emotional sediment, make sure you're doing a safe place, MDMA. Right? I mean, MDMA comes along, <laughs> ecstasy. Um, I mean, you know, that, the, and MDMA, you know, I mean, wh what's, how do you, what can you say about MDMA, ecstasy? Right? What, what, you take MDMA, I mean, first of all, the, the death rate, if you're getting pure MDMA, you know, is, is, I don't know, one in 10 million? Or, I mean, something below, you know, bee stings and things <laughs> like that, right? And, 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 but what you can say about MDMA is MDMA, when you take it, makes you feel warmly towards strangers, lovingly towards friends, and profoundly in love with your lover, your partner. It's like, you know, it's a reason why they call it the couples counseling drug, right? Because they found in California in the 70s and 80s that it was a way to, you know, basically skip the first 10 sessions of couple counseling with MDMA. You get right to the chase, right? It enables people to say and hear things, right? So I had my own, I, cocaine, I tried it, you know, and I tried it uh, numerous times, but I never liked it. For me, cocaine was like, you know, having too much coffee and post-nasal drip, right? I mean, I, I, had, I, I, I had friends who would become poets when they did cocaine, right? And, and heroin, I did feel an obligation to try it. I tried smoking and injecting, you know, with people. But, but I did, that drug, like tobacco, seemed to me the really sticky drugs, you know, that to get in there, there was just something about nicotine, tobacco, and about the opioids where if you just did it for a few weeks or a month, it was going to get hard to... Let's not go there. But apart from the drug thing, and realizing as I looked historically, I mean, one myth after another. It was fascinating mm. to read in the late 19th century how many of these drugs had been legal, how Coca-Cola had cocaine in it, but there wasn't really any big cocaine, cocaine addiction wrong, how doctors had recommended that, that inebriates, that, that, that confirmed alcoholics should switch to opium as a safer thing, and that was medically justified. It was fascinating to learn how in Britain you had doctors prescribing pharmaceutical heroin and even cocaine mm. to people for decades throughout the 20th century, and that was a public health policy. And as I was getting involved in the 80s, I was going to Europe and going to the Netherlands and to – 
to Switzerland where they were doing not just needle exchange programs to reduce AIDS, but they were doing, they, they, they were doing safe, safer injection facilities where, you had pe where people who were addicted to illicit drugs could use it in a safe place and not be injecting on the streets and not die of an overdose. And then the Swiss in the early 90s begin to say, well, if methadone doesn't work and buprenorphine doesn't work and you're a confirmed heroin addict, how about prescribing pharmaceutical heroin and doing the studies to show that that worked as well. And here was all this scientific evidence being published in the top scientific journals about needle exchange reducing HIV, about methadone maintenance being the best thing for heroin addicts, or if that didn't work, pharmaceutical heroin. And in my own country and many other parts of the world, it was like you were engaging in heresy if you pointed to the scientific articles, right? And that, it, it was, our, our, our government agencies, the National Institute on Drug Abuse in America, which has a multi-billion dollar budget, I believe, at least a billion, is the number one, is the funder of 80 to 90% of all the drug abuse research in the world. Mm. But if you look at the way that the research agenda was politicized, you realize that in the 80s and 90s, and really until recently, and maybe back again now, that trying to do innovative and honest drug abuse research in the United States was like trying to do innovative and honest social science research in the old Soviet Union. Mm. I mean, you learn that there's just certain questions the government doesn't want asked or answered. And they're not yeah. keen to provide funding for those things. <coughs> and that if you do want to buck the trend and do do research on those things, or if you come to the wrong results, well, your chances of being funded in the future lessen. Your chance of being of being invited to serve on particular committees and research committees, or being, uh, you know, I remember visiting an old graduate student friend of mine who was working in Singapore, and I said, how does it work here? And what he described was, they don't lock up dissidents in that way, but if you don't play ball with the government, if you start saying the wrong things or being too provocative or too interesting, you just stop getting invited and favored and getting promotions and all, and that what was, was going on. So I have mm. to say, you know, wh one thing led to another, and you know, I left academia. I had a, the fortune one day to get a phone call in the blue from a guy named George Soros, who at that point was a well-known guy, investor in the markets, and you know, <laughs> eventually became yeah. a very famous philanthropist, and it is committed to promoting open society ideals. And we hit it off. I left Princeton. I started up, you know, or you mm. know, got his foundation involved in in funding and advancing drug policy reform in, around the world in the U.S. Then spun out of his thing, created my organization, the Drug Policy Alliance, which when I stepped down a few months ago, you know, is the leading organization in the country, if not the world. Mm. Seventy-five people working in the U.S. around trying to roll back the war on drugs, right? Advancing drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights, right? Reducing mass incarceration, treating addiction as a health issue, understanding that recreational drug use, you know, is not a major s issue for government, right? And the other piece of this was the piece around race. Because, you know, my sense of identity and empathy with this thing was, I'm a marijuana consumer. Uh, I do some of the other things. I'm vulnerable. I could get busted. And I had my close calls, but never did get arrested. I had lots of friends who got busted, and I knew a lot of, you know, white people who were getting their lives totally messed up by either being caught or drug tested or kicked out of school or sent to jail or prison or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, if I'd been black, I mean, it, it's just an entirely different universe. Mm. I mean, you know... I, you looked at the evidence, it turned out that black people in America were no more likely to use crack cocaine than white people. But nobody believes that. Even black people don't believe that, right? But with marijuana, the evidence overwhelmingly shows that if the police were to randomly stop 100 young black men and 100 young white men in any town in America and look in their pockets, roughly the same percent of young black men and young white men would have a little weed in their pocket, a little cannabis. Right? But in every town in America, the young black man is between three and ten times more likely than the young white man to get arrested, mm. to be processed through criminal justice, all these sorts of things. And like for many Americans, that kind of, yeah, you're right, that's not fair. And why is that? Well, it's not all about racism, right? But it's racism on multiple levels. So if you live in a poor black community, well, there's a lot more cops in your neighborhood than there is in the white towns. So you're much more likely to be, you know, the, you have that, you have five times as many cops per young person than you do in the white. On the other hand, if you're a black man walking through a mostly white community, what the hell are you doing here? 
So you're going to be stopped. So whether you're in your a poor black community or you're a white community, either way you got it coming to you, right? And then you have all the other biases that are about race and also about class and poverty. So you realize that, you know, as, as, a, as, as colleague Michelle Alexander wrote, the book called The New Jim Crow, I mean, you know, Jim, New Jim, Jim Crow was America's racial apartheid system in the South in the first half of the 20th century, right, into the second half. It really, that the, the drug war had, became the New Jim Crow. And so, I mean, just to conclude, I would just say is for me, it was really about, you know what? You know, this is a cause worth fighting for. I remember being mm. in college and, you know, and, and, and in graduate school and the anti-department movement was picking up in the U.S. And, and feeling some empathy with it, but it wasn't really my struggle in that way. But this one, the war on drugs in my own, you know, country and the fact that the U.S. was propagating this war on drugs all around the world, that was fucked up mm. and something worth doing something about. And I should say... One reason I'm here now is that, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Europe and Latin America, learning, yeah, also in other parts, you know, learning what's going on, trying to get other countries to stir up this stuff outside the U.S. as well. But I'd never been to Africa, the continent of Africa, until a couple, couple of years ago. And then I happened to go to Morocco for me and the Global Commission on Drug Policy. And then last year, I went first to Dar es Salaam and then a month later to Nairobi because stuff was bubbling there. And that's why I was so, why I said to you, Sean, you want me to come down? I'm, I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. Because my real hope is that things can really start to happen in South Africa and around this continent. You know, the fact that Kofi Annan joined the Global Commission on Drug Policy, I was so stunned that he did that. Yeah. And then the fact that, you know, the former president of Nigeria, Obasango, mm -hmm. you know, joined as yeah. well. And, and so, I mean, you, you see something's bubbling. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I see some of the folks I met in, the, you know, Tanzania, Tanzania here, and I see others, and I see what you're doing here by starting this South Africa thing. You see the activism that's happening. I really hope, because God forbid Africa should follow in the footsteps of Central America. Well, you could, why? You have a drug trafficking, drug war, already you have narco dictators in West Africa. You already have, you know that drug addiction may be, may be you know, and the problems associated with poverty and social dislocation, we know that. Mm. But you know what else it's sometimes associated with? Rising wealth. Because more disposable income also means more money to spend on drugs. Now, you're less likely to get in trouble with the drugs if you have wealth, but there's going to be more drug use, more drug markets, and meanwhile, you're going to have more, more social dislocation as economies change and more urban drug problems. Mm. So there's no question that drug use and drug addiction are going to continue to rise in Africa. That's going to happen. More wealth, more dislocation for better wealth going to happen. And the question is, we have the lessons out of Europe. We have the lessons out of the U.S. We see what's been done wrong elsewhere. Is, you know, is Africa going to follow Africa broadly, right? Follow like lemmings in the footsteps of all the countries that did it the wrong way, or is there going to be this kind of open-eyed, we don't have to go that way. We can actually take the best we've already learned from the parts of the places that have done it right and follow in those footsteps. And we will not let the law enforcement mentality, we will not let the right-wing church mentality, we will not let like ignorance stay in the way. We're going to do it right here. And that's what I hope can happen in South Africa. So, so um, I, I'm going to employ Ethan as my spokesperson in future. <laughs> Um, you, okay, so, so uh, I'm going to move to other people, but I'm going to use something that you said. So, so there are a couple of points I just wanted to pick up on, on there. I, I wrote an article recently with um, the neuroscientist Mark Lewis, and, um, and unfortunately this line got edited out of it, but I, I, thought, I thought it was a great line. You know? It was, some people just do better on heroin, we need to get over it. Okay? And you expressed your, your kind of fear about heroin, and a lot of people have that fear. But I think that, that, that one of the things that we've got to remember, and especially with the, the, the multi-criteria um, analysis, uh, um, is that people are individuals, and, and, and some people have different vulnerabilities all, all along. You know? and, and like some people will die from nuts, we don't ban nuts. You know? uh, and so I think that, that often the, there is a scale in drugs which is unnecessary. Oh, cannabis is safe. Oh, well, it's safe for the majority of people. It's, uh, you know, but some, for some people, it's really not a good idea. You know, so, so we need to bear that in mind, I, I, I think. And I, and I think that one of the big 
uh, wrongs of the drug war is it pretends to treat everybody equally, but in fact it doesn't. And you made a statement a while back that you said, if crack cocaine was, um, wa was used by predominantly yeah. middle class white people yeah. and Viagra. Right, right, right. If, 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 that, that if crack cocaine was primarily used by affluent elderly white men, and, and if Viagra was primarily used by poor young black men, then smokable would cocaine it? would be easy to obtain with a prescription, and the I sale of Viagra would be punished with 10 years in prison, yeah. right? But I'm, and I'm exaggerating only slightly, but that is, is the way it works. And, and, and that for me was really interesting. And, and then I was thinking of um, the poxetine, which, which David, uh, you know, that's that, um, uh, it's a drug that supposedly uh, uh, extends um, sexual functioning, you know, for, it's for premature ejaculation, and it's, the, the drug is a, very short-acting uh, serotonin uptake inhibitor. Now, no, I, I think we know that there's another quite short-acting serotonin uptake inhibitor, sort of like the MDMA type thing. You know, it's not quite the same, but... It's, but, it's quite different, but, actually. Yeah, well, you're the expert. Yeah, yeah that's so, right. That's, uh, yeah, quite. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you're not going to make a lot of money selling the no, no, no. as MDMA. Sorry, sorry. I'm so afraid you've I'll already go, lost that career. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the first time I met David, we, we were talking, we were talking about about religion and and uh, and and the similarity between certain religious behaviours and and uh, addiction. It's very dangerous territory. We won't go there today. And, and I said, well, you know, but if we look at this, and David turns to me. He says, I think I might know a little bit more than you about that. It's the subject of my next book. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but yes, you know, the, the, the extra serotonin out there, whatever. Uh, but the no, very, but I think what you're trying to get to is a, an interest. I mean, you're getting to an interesting point, and, but it's not quite what you think. Thank you for saving me. Um, <laughs> what, one of the, there's a really interesting question here, which is why mm. is MDMA so different from other drugs that look similar? So, so that's and that, and why, yeah. and that, but to my mind, the really interesting question is why don't we know the answer to that question? Yeah. And the reason we don't know the answer to that question is because it's impossible to research MDMA. Yes. Because it's an illegal drug. And you can count on the fingers of two hands the research studies that have been done to look at how MDMA works in the brain. Uh, and you, it would take more than all the hands in this room to count the studies that have been done on SSRIs. Mm. So this, and this, I think this is, a, this is a truly worrying phenomenon because there may well be, there, well, there, there will be insights not only into how the brain works and how serotonin works, but also into the therapeutic utility of MDMA if we studied it properly. Mm. But we can't. It's, so I'm in the process of trying to, I've done one of the, three imaging studies on MDMA that's ever been done. It was a nightmare to get permissions. We're now setting up to do an MDMA study to help, to see if it can help people who are alcohol dependent. Mm. Because so many people who are alcohol dependent are drinking to do with trauma, which they've received either in childhood or in adulthood, and they're drowning their sorrows in alcohol. We know that MDMA is a very, uh, potentially quite an exciting new treatment yeah. to help people deal with PTSD. So we're wondering whether it might help people who've got sort of chronic PTSD, self-medicated with alcohol, to overcome that. Now, it's taken us two years to, to get to the point where we... I mean, I don't want to say we're going to start, because I know that's a hostage to fortune, but, but I, you, you know, we're beginning to see the end of the beginning. Mm. Uh, and the battle has been fought at m you know, m many levels. And our government brought in just recently a new hurdle about... Three months ago, they suddenly told us there's a new, you have to get an extra license now. It's not good enough to study these drugs. It's not good enough to be a doctor with a, with a, a, a license with a criminal records check. It's not good enough to have to get all the uh, registration documents to hold the drug and to buy the drug, etc., etc. Now you have to have a sp another license to research the drug. Mm. <laughs> Why? Well, be, they don't, there's no reason why, of course, but it's just... Be, oh, I think the reason is because you've got to pay them more money. Mm -hmm. so, so now I've had to go through the rig. So at every level, you know, you're jumping hurdle after hurdle and the hurdle is getting harder. But we will do it. But what a wasted opportunity. This is a remarkable drug. The guy that discovered this drug, Shulgin, realised it was 
the most I mean, this is the man who's taken more drugs than anyone ever in the history of humanity. And he realized that MDMA was a very special drug and had huge therapeutic utility. And people did explore that. And that's all been stopped just because, actually this is an interesting question mm. in semantics. When MDMA was being used in couples counseling, largely in the west coast of America, it was called empathy, yeah. which of course is what it is. Uh, but then as soon as those in idiots who started selling it for recreational use, selling it in raves, changed the name to ecstasy, that changed wow. the whole tenor of it. Because there is nothing that gets at the nose of the right-wing press more than young people having ecstasy. Mm. Because those editors can't remember ever having ecstasy. <laughs> and if they ever did, they know they're never going to get it again. And they're damn sure they don't want young people going there. So, so, the, so the attack on, on ecstasy, on MDMA, was driven by... you know the creation of a lot of falsehoods around its harms. Mm. Well, you, know, I think you, you think that both Prozac, right, the antidepressant, and ecstasy and MDMA operate on the serotonin levels, but in a way, Prozac's a mattress, and MDMA is a trampoline. <laughs> and to some extent, governments don't like trampoline drugs. They like mattress drugs. Yeah, right? yeah I, I, I would agree with you. We, we were having the, the conversation about euphoria and, and how, how um, you know, a lot of people don't like this idea that that, that euphoria should be there. But I, I want to get back to one other point, and Neil, we'll get to you in a minute, because uh, you've got a particular expertise that, that I want to tap into there as well. But, but um, you, you mentioned the NIH NIDA um, kind, of, kind of thing, about 80% of the research. And I find that really interesting, because, because the relevance of that research, and a lot of that research is being done around the world, as you say, in, in this country as well. And I often wonder about the relevance of that research, and, and also the political agenda behind what research gets done and not. And then, more importantly as well, the involvement of people who use drugs in the design of that research, which is about zero, okay? And then, and then the, 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 the way that, that a researcher, so for example, I love the classic when they say they want to, they want to recruit for a research on methamphetamine, yeah. and they want people who are only methamphetamine users and they've been using for X amount of time. Now, I personally don't know a single methamphetamine user who only uses methamphetamine. And if he is, he probably doesn't have as much as a problem yeah. well, as somebody else. I mean, I mean there's a, a bunch of things about that. I mean, the first one, of course, I remember that when we were beginning to get, trying to move forward the issue of prescribing pharmaceutical heroin to people who had been long time mm. illegal heroin addicts and who had not succeeded with methadone or buprenorphine or drug-free treatment. And we, one of the leading HIV AIDS researchers in mm. Canada, Marty Schechter, we have a meeting, this was 20 years ago, and we start talking about all the politics and efforts about trying to get this going in either the US or Canada. And at the end of the day, this guy, Marty Schechter, a leading AIDS researcher, he goes, let me tell you something. I know about politics and scientific research. I've been working in AIDS for years. And he goes, I got to tell you something. Working in AIDS as a researcher is nothing compared to trying to do stuff on the illegal drug area. Mm. That, that, and here in South Africa, you obviously have dealt with crazy politics around AIDS. But the truth is, it gets even crazier on the drug stuff. I think that we now have a national drug abuse, which, where the director is obsessed with this notion of addiction as a brain disease. Right? Mm. And it's certainly interesting to try to understand more about the mm. brain and drugs. Mm. But billions of dollars have been put into that now with not one shred of evidence that I'm aware of showing that all of this expenditure is helping to deal with the problems of drug addiction. And meanwhile, what one would say, you know, I said this at a, at a, at a U.S. Senate hearing last year, uh, because we have this crisis now with people dying of overdoses involving either heroin or pharmaceutical opioids. I say what we really need to do is to pay for thousands of ethnographers, of anthropologists, whose job it is to go out and interview thousands and tens of thousands mm. of people using drugs, selling drugs, all of this, to find out 
why they're doing what they're doing, how they're doing what they're doing, what precautions, if any, they're taking. I mean, all to understand this phenomenon really, really deeply. We eventually began to do that in the areas of HIV, with injecting drug users and others to understand if we're going to have interventions to try to reduce the spread of HIV, whether it's among men who have sex with men or whether it's other people or whether it's injecting drug users, we need to understand that by interviewing them. But in the drug area, that type of research, like trying to seek true knowledge about mm. what's going on, because ultimately, you know, understanding drugs, well, you were quoting earlier Norman Zinberg, the Harvard yeah, professor yeah, 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 on drug right. set and yeah. setting. For those of you who know, there's a, there's a famous concept in understanding drugs called drug set and setting, which was a term coined initially by Timothy Leary, the famous yeah. guy with the LSD, you know, and counterculture, and then a guy named Andrew Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil, a leading integrative medicine specialist who wrote a good book called The Natural Mind, wonderful bug book about why people use drugs, and then Zimberg, and then Zim Zimberg studied it. And what they say is if you want to understand drugs, there's really three things to understand. The first one is the drug, which is, is it a stimulant or a depressant? Um, what's the difference between smoking and injecting it, eating it, drinking it, et cetera, right? But understanding the drug, heroin versus cocaine versus amphetamine versus MDMA versus LSD versus alcohol versus nicotine, only tells you a small part about what you need to know about the impact of that drug on individuals. You also need to understand, secondly, the set. The set is, what do you think that drug is going to do to you? What's your expectation about that, what that drug is going to do to you when you use it? Because people radi differ radically. Some people drink alcohol and they go, I know when I get ra drink alcohol, I can go crazy and get violent and reckless. So other people, I'll, I'll get happy. Oh, other people, I can kind of bury my depressions in. You know what I mean? And it's the same thing with other drugs, whether it's marijuana, opiates, what have you. And then there's the setting. And the setting is what is your social milieu, your culture, mm. tell you about this substance, right? Why is it? that when people in Southern Europe drink alcohol, it looks totally different than the way people in Northern Europe, Scandinavia, mm -hmm. Russia, drink alcohol, right? In, in, if, you know, in, in, in Southern Europe, you know, it's, you know, drink, eat, manja, you know, wine with food. I mean, it's, you know, people make it tipsy and drunk, but, you know, you go into Scandinavia or Northern Russia, Northern mm -hmm. Canada, right? You know, you mean you would drink without getting drunk? What's the point of drinking alcohol without getting drunk, like getting falling down drunk? It's a radically different idea. If you look at alcohol use among Aboriginal people, right, in, in North America, in, 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 uh, in Australia, whatever, alcohol use among Aboriginal people looks a lot more like crack cocaine use among very poor people in other parts of the world than it looks like alcohol mm. use among other people. If you ask the question, what's the addiction rate? So let's say alcohol. How do you answer that question? Well, in my country, what you'll see is that, for example, um, Jewish Americans and Asian Americans are very likely to drink, but have relatively lower rates of addiction to alcohol. <laughs> Irish Americans, right, are less likely to drink, but and, and African Americans less likely to drink, but among those who do, much more likely to have a problem. Mm. And if you live in an Aboriginal population, very high rates of alcohol addiction, unless you happen to belong to the Native American church, which has integrated peyote, a psychedelic you know, substance into his tradition, which does not have those levels. But same drug, radically different types of problems in use depending upon the broader culture. So unfortunately, our research agencies don't really want to look at that. No. It, it, it's what you have with your politicians, and the active avoidance of real knowledge. But Absolutely, I, 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 would, I would agree with that. And um, sort of only second uh, only to Andrew Wakefield's paper, Leshner's 1997, uh, you know, paper on, well, it's not a paper, it's an opinion piece, which starts with that, you know, addiction is a brain disease and it matters. I think he's one of the most dangerous papers that we've ever seen, personally. Okay, we won't go there. But, um, and Nora Volker's obsession with brain imaging has stopped uh, sort of the anthropological and ethnographic research being funded uh, and triangulated with the, with the other data in the brain research, not to minimize the brain research. I think it's really interesting in that. But Neil, I, I, I want to get to you quickly before we start opening the floor to some questions. Um, uh, you know, you said in the beginning that, that, that uh, about the, you try to make yourself the most vulnerable individual. Uh, you know, you, you look like the most vulnerable person, the, the, the person to, to break into the, um, the, the sort of dealing circles, the drug dealer circles, you, you do that. 
isn't that also true, though, that, that the people that suffer the most from drug policy are not the big kingpins, and, and that, but the most vulnerable? You know, the, the woman you were talking about who, who was uh, um, you know, a sex worker and, and that. And, and as a policeman, because we've done some, some quite interesting research with, with police and, and working with a cohort of, of street-level police guys, and they come up with really interesting solutions, more so than some of the academics, simply because they're in contact daily. What, what, what's your experience around that? Yeah, I mean, you, you are completely right that um, the people who have the greatest problems, social problems in particular, uh, problematic drug use, they are the people who are being trampled in the middle. They're caught in the crossfire, literally, because they're, they're the people who are the most manipulated by organised crime. And obviously, they're the people also most manipulated by pe people like, the, like I used to do. They're, they're just they're caught in the crossfire. They're, they're, they're it pawns, pawns in the game, really. Put pawns in it all. Um, I mean, the most vulnerable people, as I've said, were, were the most easy to manipulate. But I should just explain just how these people are exploited by organised crime. So, for example, often a prohibitionist argument is to say that um, if we were to legalise heroin, it would increase use. But, of course, history clearly shows us that the opposite happened. In, in the UK, there are only 1,400 uh, heroin users before it was banned in the whole country. Mm. And, in fact, heroin use was falling at the time that they brought in the Misuse of Drugs Act. It was falling. Mm. And then, of course, as soon as they banned it, then you've got this incredibly valuable black market and organised crime took over. And what gangsters do, and I've seen this in action, I've, I've, I've seen this time and time again, is that as soon as someone does have a problem with heroin, they, they generally have three choices. They can either steal to pay for it, or they can um, be sexually exploited, or they can sell heroin. Now, gangsters love user dealers. They absolutely love them because they're the first point of contact for, for a wider market. And, of course, gangsters will encourage user dealers to build up a big, as big a habit as possible. They will encourage them to use more. They will lay on a weight. They will loan them a weight to say, you pay us back when, you've, mm. when you use it, knowing that they're going um, to be exploited for much more debt. And so it grows. And that's, that's why we went from 1,400 users in 1969 to almost, well, to over 400,000 by about 1992, 93, um, which, is, which is the most incredible epidemic which was caused by, by banning the drug. And, and that's because those vulnerable people caught in the crossfire were exploited. Mm. Is that what you meant? Yeah, no, so you, you, you spoke in your book about um, sort of kicking down the door uh, of a place and... and uh, or, or not you personally, you know, but the, the team going into the place and, and the kind of futility of that and the increasing violence. And I think that, that that for me is quite important because in the South African context, we had this apartheid style policing that was there. And when a, you know, apartheid was, you know, was, was dismantled uh, politically, um, those forces still remained. And, and they now have become... Uh, the drug war forces in a lot of way, or the gangs forces. And th there was an example the other day which shocked me uh, of, a, of a case in um, Mannenberg where they, they fenced off the whole area, basically. They went in at 4 o'clock in the morning. They, um, they raided uh, 27 houses in that area. Nobody could go in or out, including the people on their way to work. And, and, and the net result was 26,000 rand in cash, 50-something... Uh, grams of, of uh, cannabis and a firearm in the possession of the licensed owner, which, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know why you need to report that. Uh, and when they interviewed members of the community, they were saying, um, no, it's okay because they were looking for drugs. I is that the thing in the UK? And we also know in the UK, Release did that survey, that more black people in the UK are, are searched than any other. Group. Yeah, I mean... Um what, what you're talking about there, that is, there's, there's an interesting comparison with the, with the old school policing. Now, wh when, I was, um, when I was trained back in 1989 in uniform by my tutor, he was, he was very old school and, and British, British in his outlook. And he says, whatever we do, we treat everyone with respect, everybody. And so we did all sorts of work. We arrested people for, for theft. And, and one day we, we got a warrant, uh, a theft act warrant to 
go into somebody's home to gather evidence for a robbery. Now, basically, this offender had gone into this uh, off-license and he'd used a baseball bat and a, wearing a most bi- motorcycle helmet. It's a violent crime to threaten someone to, to get the money. And he said, uh, he said to me, I don't see any need to smash the door down here. We just knock on the door and ask, ask him to talk to him. Mm. So we did. We knocked on the door, explained why we were there, showed him the warrant, he invited us in. He showed us the motorbike helmet and the baseball bat. And we arrested him, and it was all done extremely civilised. And, and, and that was generally, that was basically how I was caught, according, according, taught according to Peel's principles. Mm. And so where you have a warrant in the UK for fire, I've even done a firearms warrant where I've knocked on the door in the UK because it was deemed low risk. Now, the trouble is, in 1971, we had the Misuse of Drugs Act, this massive war chest of powers which came, which is replicated in most countries. What what did you call it, David? The the Misuse of of Drugs Act? You said it was uh, the worst act since they tried to ban Catholicism or something like that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, uh, well, uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act is bad, but we have a new act. We have a new act in Britain. Britain, we now lead the world in oppression of, uh, of cognitive liberty because last year on the 27th of May, you can see it's etched in my mind, we, um, we brought in an act which called the Psychoactive Substances Act, mm. which, which bans any substance now or forever, evermore to be, that works on the brain <laughs> other than alcohol, tobacco and caffeine even if it's harmless, even if it's good for you. They're all illegal by default. And I, that's the act, that, that's the, oh, okay, okay. the worst censorship of, uh, of human choice <laughs> since you'll all remember 1559 when the first Elizabeth Queen, we have the second one now, Elizabeth I um, brought in the act that banned the Catholic communion. Uh, so we've actually gone to the ultimate extreme now of banning everything that could ever be mm. just because it might affect how you feel, mm. even if it's even if it's good for you. I mean, it's just surreal. I mean, well, you know, we're living in a complete fanciful world now. But anyway, you carry on no, your story. Carry on with the story. Yeah. So, so in 1971, they brought this war chest of, of powers, stop and search powers, and powers to enter people's property for drugs, and the police didn't really know what to do with it, not 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 to start with. But so they they started looking for drugs and executing drugs warrants. But they quickly found that someone would possibly flush the evidence down the toilet or swallow it in order to, to get rid of the evidence. Now, this has never been a problem before because if you're looking for a stolen TV, that can't be flushed down the toilet. <laughs> now, the, pr- the problem is that the Police Property Act in the UK and it's similar around the world that if you cause damage going in there and you don't find anything that's incriminating, the police have to pay for it. So you really need to find the evidence or you're in trouble. And another thing you found, of course, is that if someone swallowed the drugs and someone overdosed you are probably in trouble as well. Or you'd have a shift where you'd lose half, half your people looking after someone in hospital while they had their stomach pumped. So it was found that new tactics had to be developed. And this is, this is developed into the way that it's done now in, in the UK. And this is a, this will be a standard briefing for any drugs warrant from a sergeant to their troops. The instruction will be, you have a certain responsibility for each room, you're go when they're asleep, smash the door in, and then shout and scream. And this will be you, these words will be used in any briefing. Cause some fear. That's the words that's used to the police. Cause fear, disorientate people, get control of it as fast as possible, control people by getting them face down on the floor and handcuffed behind the back, and then you shout at the top of your voice that the room is clear. You get everyone under control so no one can swallow anything, no one can move. Now, that is a peculiar thing because we are smashing our way into someone's home to terrify them, to protect them from themselves, <laughs> apparently. But if you, but if referring back to the instructions I had from my tutor and Peel's principles, it, that's a complete perversion of them. It's a complete perversion of the principles of policing. And, um, and especially, as you rightly said, Sean, in the UK... If, if you're black, you are six times more likely to be stop, st- stop searched in the street for drugs than if you're white. Six times. If you're stood in the dock in the UK to be sentenced for a drug offence, if you're black, 
you are 13 times more likely to go to prison than a white person. And if you consider the level of violence which I've just described, which is involved in, in pursuing that, that is a lot of community damage, that's a lot of damaged people, and that's a lot of traumatised people. Thank you, Neil. I think it brings us back to your, your, your multi-criteria uh, analysis. You know, the biggest harm has to be policy to a large degree and, and the legal context. Um, Raquel, I know you're amping to come up here, but let's take some questions. And if we can't fit you in tonight, I promise you we'll fit you on, on Thursday night at this. But uh, maybe the right question will come up and then we'll, we'll bring you up here. So uh, let's open the floor. We, um, I'd like to take a couple of questions. Uh, please, these are questions, not uh, manifestos and statements. Um, I, I've seen one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that, that'll be good. Mike, I'm glad I've got you here. Okay, so, so uh, if you'd like to, to make your first question, but I'm going to bring a microphone up to you so we can uh, capture this. And... Uh, So, okay, do, you, do you want to direct it to a specific person? Or? Uh, no, I think just about anyone. And, um, and, and just, if you don't mind just saying your name and, uh, and where you're fr from or uh, not. My no. name's uh, Ross Campbell. I'm from uh, Durban originally. been living in Cape Town for most of my life. The so. uh, question that I have is uh, what would you uh, recommend to anyone who is currently facing uh, any drug-related charges? You know, how should they uh, you know, go about with you know, current policies in place? Well, I gather the standard approach now in South Africa is to appeal to the constitutional court that uh, the drug laws are uh, unconstitutional. That seems to be happening in several cases. But beyond that, I couldn't say any more because I don't quite know what the law is here. Do you have, um, when you go to court, do you have police providing expert evidence in court here? Do you, do you know, do you know that? So, so, for example, for, for a, a police officer to give a, opinion evidence to say that, oh, this is a scary amount of drugs, he's obviously a dealer. Um, do, do you have that? We have that in the UK. You do? Yeah? Well, my, my advice is um, always challenge that. Always find mm -hmm. a good solicitor and always find a defence expert because the, the police system, they, they're, they're pursuing... They, they, they are legally neutral, but in practicalities... It's always an exaggeration, in my view. So that's the little bit of advice I can give that might mm. translate from my country. So, um, yeah, it, it's a bit difficult for them to answer directly your question, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, deny, deny, deny. Uh, who, who, who was, you? sorry, uh, sorry, it was an order of questions. Uh, were you one of the ones that? I have a question, yeah. Yeah, okay, but we were going one, who was two, two? Three, and then there was um, four, and then there was Mike uh, five, Mike five, and then we'll see how we go from there. So, your question first. Yeah. Uh, question to uh, David Knight: What are your thoughts on um, addiction to uh, things other than substances? Here we go, David. Here we go. David. Yeah. And uh, well, clearly, uh, th that exists. Uh, I think it's um, an interesting phenomenon. It's uh, something we're using in research uh, to deal with the big question, which is to what extent do any findings that you have when you're studying someone who's uh, had drug addiction, to what extent are those findings related to the chronic use of the drug? Uh, and so, for instance, um, we're studying gamblers, people mm. who have problem gambling with a view to try to understand what the uh, uh, brain substrates of that uh, dependence might be, um, because most of these are, are dependent on other drugs. Uh, and um, I think, so it's, just, it's quite a profitable research uh, approach at present, and it's thrown up some quite interesting findings which suggest that there might be, uh, for instance, endorphin deficiencies in gamblers, which could explain why they uh, only get pleasure from gambling. Uh, and we're now rolling that study out to look at, to see whether the same is true for people with other addictions. And certainly, uh, 
we're finding very similar results in alcoholics. So one idea that's developing is it may be that individuals who become dependent on a, uh, a behavior or a drug as opposed to those who can use it and um, without con losing control. It might be that that ends either starts off activating a system which they don't normally activate in terms of reward or ends up becoming the only mechanism by which they can generate uh, an adequate level of pleasure or reward in their brain. Let me just add to that. There's a, con there was a book written in the early 70s called Love and Addiction yeah, Stanton's by Stanton Peel. Yes. And, and then he wrote another book called The Meaning of Addiction and others since then. But what he essentially did was he compared love relationships to drug yeah. relationships and made the point that in a way, with many things, it's really not about the drug so much. It's about the relationship. Yeah. And one can have a healthy relationship or a problematic relationship. If you look, for example, the phenomenon of people falling in love and the phenomenon of falling in love with a drug, not all that different. If you look at breakups from a drug and breakups from a relationship, not all that different yeah. in terms of the depression, withdrawal, relapse, I mean, all of these things. <laughs> and, 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 and then the broader point of this, of course, it's not if you look at gambling, right? If you look what happens to the human body for compulsive gamblers and for compulsive cocaine users, remarkably similar, right? Yeah. And that drugs have certain properties, but in a way, all sorts of activity. The pursuit of money for some people is a massive addiction. For some people, they get addicted to running, where if they don't run for a day, they go through a massive withdrawal, right? I mean, their bodies have been wired in this way. So there's a, there's this sense, and you know, as, as Sean was saying before, it's not like some drugs are safe and some drugs are dangerous. I have a positive relationship with marijuana, but I have people close to me who have a terrible relationship with marijuana, who lose perspective, a problem, I mean, really devastating. Conversely, there are people with cocaine who are able to use it casually, recreationally, or heroin, you know, for a lifetime without ever having a problem. They see the net benefit in their life life with good reason and other people for whom it's devastating. And the same thing can be true of so many other types of relationship, to money, to work, to people, to gambling, to sports, to whatever it might be. And so I think this kind of, uh, uh, what was the word it called? Uh, pharmacocentrism, yeah. right? The overemphasizing of, of, of the role of the drug in all this, it really helps to step back and put this into a broader context. So even that, that's very interesting. I, I gave the keynote address at the uh, National Responsible Gambling thing uh, last year, and um, and I spoke a lot about that. And, and it, what I find quite interesting is that casinos try and create an environment that makes you dependent, but just not too dependent on the gambling. They well, try, try and create that, that. There was this difference. But I look, you know, sometimes I look at the European model of casino regulation and the U.S. model, yeah. right? And my sense, and maybe this is not fully accurate, right, was that if you look in the U.K. to some extent or the Netherlands or other places where they allow, where they legally regulate gambling, it's really about trying to often put on regulations to restrict the ability to which casinos or lotteries can appeal to the addictive yeah. element or the addictive yeah. compulsion, right? And then using the tax yeah. revenues to support those people who do. In the U.S. context, we don't really have a middle ground, right? We either prohibit something and arrest people or throw in the black market, or we make it legal, and in which case we have casinos open 24-7 with women serving mm. alcohol and short skirts and all this sort of stuff, or we do uh, you know, government-sponsored lottos where they do advertisements on the sides of buses specifically designed to appeal to compulsive gambling types of personalities, right? Yeah. So it is a question about responsible regulation and how yeah. you're going to handle what, this. What was very interesting for me was at the end of the talk, um, the one uh, woman said, she, she stood up at the back and she said, uh, we're talking about gambling and all the rest. She said, but you know what? Every Sunday, there's a group of people who go and give 10% of their wealth away. How's that any different? And I said, oh, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that. You've got a question. They're investing in the future, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yes. <laughs> Speak into the microphone. Can, I speak? Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm a clinical psychologist and a great believer in the therapeutic use of psilocybin. Um, so, but my question to Dr. Nutt about your potential MDMA um, research, um, I presume you would be having a therapeutic component to it as well. Yeah, that's really, and, uh, yeah, and, and of course you, you probably can know. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And, so and we've and done psilocybin studies as well now. And yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, and th this gets. Oh, really back to the point that Ethan was making, it's not just about the drug, it's about the drug and the uh, therapy that goes with it. So people, yeah, I mean, it's quite a sophisticated process and it's about 
preparing people and then taking them through the experience and then integrating the experience they had with their um, well it's 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 not there's no specific there's, in fact it's actually at, deliberately there is no s conceptual framework to impose because individuals want to go where they want to go and there often uh, are experiences that they've particularly in the depression trials they've had a lot of cognitive therapy and and they you should, you should read the papers. It's only just been published recently mm -hmm. on the narratives of the patients. And often they, they found that cognitive therapy was too prescriptive. It was too yeah. dogmatic. It was driving them, making them think about their problems in, in one way with only one solution. And after, on the side of Cybin, they could think about them in a very different way. Yeah. So, so our psychotherapy is, is about allowing them to use the experience to overcome whatever problems they had. Yeah. And um, you know, so far, so good. But that's interesting because, because, as I said earlier, but I don't think you were there, uh, talking about the S uh, SAMHSA uh, list of evidence-based interventions uh, and the fact that actually they found that the intervention itself, there was no statistical difference between a lot of them. It was the way it was developed and the freedom of the person to allow to di direct that. Yeah, I mean, half the therapeutic impact is at, le at least that con um, offered or um, um, uh, originates from the individual making an active decision to engage in the therapy. Correct. Uh, he, hence, uh, um, opioid substitution therapy, the Baltimore study and the Yale study, and that showing that, that just the contact with the doctor and itself was often better than uh, you know, including a, a psychotherapy with it, um, or as effective, shall I say, as effective. Um, well, I, I mean... You know, Doctors are a sort of psycho. Yeah, most exactly. Doctors. No, no, but good that doctors. The point. That good the doctors point. are very psychotherapy. Right. So that Cochrane, <laughs> the Cochrane review ends with the line, with the line. Uh, so you know, you don't, you shouldn't insist on psychosocial services. However, uh, everyone included some form of psycho counselling with the doctor himself. You know, the, the primary. Because the big challenge is getting good doctors. <laughs> yeah, I, of course. But you know, but you, you want to say something, Ethan, and then I mean, we'll go to Matt. Because you the interesting question about the Mike use of of psilocybin, which is, you know, um, which is with, in, in mushrooms, or MDMA, or LSD. And, and there, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, there was some research done in the US and elsewhere about these benefits. And there was some really interesting findings. And then when LSD became the drug of the counterculture, all of this stuff was basically banned for 30, 40 years. And now it's come back because of organizations in the US like Hefter Society and MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, the Beckley Foundation in England, individual researchers in Switzerland and a range of other places. But I mean, what, what's happening with some of this research in terms of the use of psychedelics, and then MDMA is not a psychedelic because you don't see hallucinations. It, it is an empathogen, right? It is a, a heart opening drug. Um, it is that the findings in terms of dealing with things like fear of dying, with PTSD, with trauma, with a range of other illnesses, um, in terms of how one deals, the findings are absolutely extraordinary. And you have hard scientists, right? People who have, you know, be, earned their reputations looking at a variety of other drugs who are now having this problem because they want to keep sounding like hard scientists, but their results are being so outstanding mm. that it's hard to sound something like other than a true believer, even though they're speaking to scientists. For some of you, I don't know how many of you have heard of the food writer, uh, Michael Pollan. He's a very well-known American writer who wrote the book, The Omnivore's Di Dilemma. He's got a book that's going to come out next year on psychedelics and medicine, which I think is really going to open up the discussion in a big way. But it's at the same time important to understand that y you, there's a, there can be a significant value added in using the psychedelics in a therapeutic way mm -hmm. with a trained therapist. Right, it increases the likelihood that the experiment, that the that the intervention will go well, mm -hmm. that the people won't have a bad trip, that they'll have a positive outcome. Yet at the same time, we have to not forget that millions of people around the world throughout history have experienced very substantial benefits in their lives without any therapist or physician being involved. Mm. I made the reference before to the, 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 the Native American church, the Na Aboriginal group in the US that uses peyote in its ceremonies. Some of you may be familiar with the use of ayahuasca, either in its traditional uses in Latin America or now being used much more, I'm sure there are ayahuasca ceremonies going on in South Africa in different places, you know, probably this weekend and most every other weekend, right, with either traditional shamans and others. So there's, there really is remarkable evidence about, and it's not that these things are risk-free. 
right? Because there are people who do wildly stupid things and jump off buildings and think they can fly. There are people who are, have a vulnerability of mental illness and who can have a break. So, you know, nothing, no psychoactive drug, you know, is dangerous for everybody and nothing is safe for everybody. But it is to say that the benefits of these things cross-culturally and historically have been very, very substantial. And, 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 and it, I have to say, I was just, in doing some reading coming to South Africa, I was looking at reading about the, the history of, of some of the South, South African drug history. And one was a piece about what happened when 65,000 mm. uh, Chinese indentured uh, workers were imported to the Transvaal to work in mining on the RAND back in the first decade of the last century, right? And, and some of them came with the opium use. Others had always wanted to use opium, and now they had enough money while they were working in South Africa to do it. And so you have a, a, and all of the debates that happened around that. But the other one was a fascinating piece about, what do you call them, the Khoi Khoi? Mm. The Khoi Khoi, okay. uh, that was what the name of one yeah. of the aboriginal groups here. But yeah. there the, the use of, of Daha, but also something I never heard of, of Kana. And Kana uh -huh. is another substance, um, and, and the ways in which it was used. And it was a very interesting study that looked at the ways in which these things were used, not just instructive ways, but in sort of positive ways in these cultures as a way of kind of dealing with other tensions and things like that that was actually mm. reinforcing and building. So this tradition of using powerful psychoactive substances, there is in Latin America some tradition of using tobacco in ways that make it sound like psych psychedelics, using very yeah. potent, you know, nicotine-based tobacco in a way that sounds nothing like smoking cigarettes. It sounds more like using mu magic mushrooms. Mm. So, you know, just understanding this history is rich and it's beginning to be understood and explored way in ways now that scientists are really owning and that journalists are beginning mm. to write about in a responsible way. So I think Siegel talks about that in his book, Intoxication and the Universal Drive for Altered States. Matt, you, your question, and then, and then Mike, and then, and then I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, Matt. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I was just, as I was listening to you, I was just rem uh, remembering when I was on the UK delegation to the Commission on Narcotic Drugs as, a, as an NGO representative, and in one of the sort of in-between formal discussions, I was having a, ch a chance to talk to some of the uh, US um, yeah. professional diplomats. And they were having a discussion with me as a drug user and asking those questions they'd always wanted to ask. And their lack of knowledge was absolutely remarkable. And there was a sort of ch challenge of them talking very open to me about my ecstasy use, my heroin dependency, and that incredible complexity of drug use, that there isn't a simple, easy answer. Whereas the sort of Nancy Reagan, just say no model is so much easier to argue, even if it's complete fallacy, it's just, uh, it's a much easier message to message. And I'm just wondering, from your different perspectives, how you think we as advocates can manage that complexity with, to, to be authentic to the, the science, to you know, genuine to what the research tells us, and at the same time to manage the need to be clear and simple in our messaging as advocates. Well, my, my answer to that would be um, basically get experts together to make the law and take it out of the politicians' hands. And that's kind of what we, tr you know, it, we ha some countries have done that. The Netherlands has done it rather well. You know, it does respect its, its scientists and it, it's had a, a, a much more rational policy on all drugs. So it can be done. It, the problem it, is when drugs become too useful a political tool, and we have to stop politicians doing that. And the best way is, that, is to entrench in a constitution the decision-making by people who aren't going to be elected. If we, if we had a, another hour, this is where Rachel will come in and, and talk about Uruguay experience, but we'll do that on Thursday. That's called whetting your appetite, by the way. Uh, okay. I, yeah, I would just say that um, I, I don't think you can really understand drugs. I mean, th there's obviously the scientific perspective, and I completely uh, agree with David that you should just it's an, insist on an evidence-based policy. But I don't think you can really understand drugs unless you understand uh, the views of drug users, and, and, and that's absolutely core to it. And it's, that is core of... It's core to building the social movement as well. So, I mean, it was, I think the point was made earlier on in the discussion um, that people have a fear of what they don't know mm. and, and that contributes to the moral panic and that once people, if people understand it better, then that moral panic can, can, can at least start to dissolve. So I think what you're doing is, is actually crucial to it in, in the way that you do it because um, people who use drugs know better. And, and so we just need to get that conversation out there. So all of us that are working within reform 
need to use all of that information and engage with each other to form a, as broad an alliance as possible just to get that conversation going in as, as far as we possibly can. You know, let me just also, Matthew, I think what Neil just said, it, it's not just the experts. Would you, as a well-spoken and knowledgeable, experienced drug user, do by speaking to people coming from official limb with kind of, I, I, you think about, let's say that in 50 years ago, everybody in America, and probably here too, knew a homosexual. They just didn't know they knew a homosexual. <laughs> and therefore, their image of who was a homosexual was determined by their fears, by what they read in newspapers, about people getting arrested in men's rooms, about, about you know, very flamboyant gay people, you know, I mean, this sort of stuff. Now, of course, everybody in America in your country knows a homosexual and a person who's gay or lesbian, and it could be their cousin or coworker or friend or blah, 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 blah. And their view of it has become incredibly more nuanced and understanding and less, it's just radically different. Well, today in your country and mine, everybody knows a heroin, a cocaine, an amphetamine, a crack user. They just don't know they know them. Right? And therefore, their image is shaped by the media, the propaganda. Right? And so therefore, the extent to which we find ways where people can come out as you did with these people, I'll just give a couple of anecdotes. I mean, one I was sharing with David before, I remember meeting a guy who had a legal heroin script. Right, He'd been a street heroin addict and, and was in England. And he had a legal script. And I said, oh, can I, he was about to inject, I said, can I watch you? And so we sit down, we're chatting, and he prepares himself, and then he injects actually in his groin right here, and we're just talking like having a conversation. And I say, so how do you feel? And he's just talking, and he goes, well, I just feel calmer. I mean, before I did this, I was feeling a little more agitated, and I'm just feeling calmer. But here we have having a normal conversation. He's just in in injected a healthy dose of heroin. And so for me, even as an expert, having that contact with somebody who was just beginning to have contact and under seeing the view there. I'll give you a second story. The American television program, 60 Minutes, our famous program, did a, a thing about the Swiss heroin prescribing program. Mm. And they did this scene, it was a very sympathetic uh, portrait, and they interview these, uh, this woman who was in the heroin maintenance program and her parents. And I, I always tear up when I tell the story, but, but they basically, here the woman is, she had been a, a living on, the, the, the interviewer asked her, the parents, how did you feel when you knew your daughter was living on the streets, selling her body to support her habit? And the parents look at one another and they go, we wish she would be dead. And then they look at their daughter, who's now robust and she's fine and she's got part-time employment, her life's coming together. She's still taking heroin two or three times a day. It's pharmaceutical heroin. She's getting treatment and they realized the absurdity of the way they had thought before. And I'll tell you one last story. In building the Drug Policy Alliance, we built this idea that we should have people from across the political spectrum, from people from across the drug use spectrum, in other words, from people who have enjoyed drugs and benefited to people who have been devastated by drugs, and then we should have people from across the drug law spectrum, from people who spend decades behind bars on a drug charge to people who spend decades enforcing the drug laws and now, like Neil, think they're not right to do, right? And, and it's about understanding all of the harms that the war on drugs does. And we have a big focus in ours about issues around class and racial justice. But one of the things that I always try to do is to put in a human story in the psychedelics. And we had in our closing plenary somebody talking about the racial element, somebody talking about AIDS and needle exchange programs or methadone. And then I put up the, on the final plenary a woman, a middle-aged woman, who told the story about when their daughter got a terminal cancer in her late teens, early 20s, and how the family was just being destroyed, and how the girl and her father couldn't even speak to one another. They just didn't know. And they landed up doing an MDMA experience, the mother, the father, and the daughter who had terminal cancer. And the transformation in the relationship between the father and the daughter that enabled them to deal with the last months of this life in a loving, compassionate way, and they gave the daughter the courage to approach it and the father do it. And the, I remember this thing because 
half the people coming to our conference are coming in there because of the racial injustice of the drug war. They didn't know anything about this MDMA thing. And for them to see this other element of, about what drugs are about and about the prohibition of this stuff, it's that type of opening up of hearts and minds that's about what building this movement mm -hmm. is. Thank you. Uh, we will get your question now, Mike. Uh, it just reminds me as well. Uh, it's very. Uh, uh, I, I remember in, in South Africa when, when I was struggling to get the message across um, about people who use drugs, and, and Dr. Andrew Scheiber, uh, who I work very closely with, uh, we were in Tanzania on a study tour with the UNODC, and, and we came back, and he'd organized this meeting between two members of the Central Drug, Drug Authority. David, are you still here? No, I think he's, he's just left. Okay. So David Baover was there, uh, chairman of the Central Drug Authority, and, and we brought... Uh, I think it was 50 uh, street dwelling injecting heroin users into this hotel, and we put them in groups. Now, now the only way this had ever been done before was sort of the, the, the ad exec kind of drug user, and he's one, and, and the other guys around him. Now we had the, uh, the ratios were totally reversed, and they spent two days talking to each other, and um, and and it's the change that we saw in those members of the Central Drug Authority and other NGO people who'd never even spoken to the population they were serving was, was tremendous. And, and this year, for the first time ever in South Africa's history, the Central Drug Authority, uh, with support from UNODC, and uh, w we managed to have three consultations with people most impacted by drug policy, where, where three executive members sat with 20 people who use drugs and listen to their stories. And the report's coming out on Thursday, in fact, of that engagement. And it's a report written entirely by people who use drugs, reporting on their consultation with the CDA. And, and that's going to, to help inform the new National Drug Master Plan, which they're busy developing at the moment for the first time. It's relational. Yeah. It's about relationships. Mike. Right, th 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 thanks, Sean. Hi, I'm uh, Mike West. I'm a psychiatrist in, in private practice in Cape Town. I also have an interest in how people actually obtain the drugs um, that they are using when they come to see me. So my question is for Neil. Uh, but thank you just to the panel every for, for everyone that was involved. It really was a privilege to hear all of you speak. But for Neil, how, how would you anticipate traditional drug markets and organized crime networks changing in response to changing in drug policies, such as decriminalization or legalization, um, considering, for example, the more traditional industries like the gambling industry, the sex trade industry, um, nightclubs, and so on and so on? Well, the, the biggest misunderstanding about crime is that it's caused by criminals. It's not. It's caused by opportunity. And the biggest opportunity in the world for crime is creating crime by prohibiting drugs. So the entire industry and the entire recruitment process for anyone who's involved in uh, the supply of drugs, that they have been sucked into that because of the opportunity that it, that it provides. So once you regulate that market, you, you, you will remove that. I mean, you can never completely remove a black market. For, inst for example, in, in the UK, we have, uh, on the south coast of the UK, 10% of our alcohol market is actually smuggled. So we do have a black market and organised crime are involved. But you have to remember that 10% is only about saving the tax. It's not 100% value of the product. So that 10% is actually a really tiny percentage of the overall wealth. And I think that the most important... So, so you won't get rid of the black market completely, but the most important part of removing the black market is, is this. In any unregulated market, monopolies appear. And those monopolies are actually created and strengthened by policing drugs. So police will inevitably, more often, get rid of the low-hanging fruit than the, than the more sophisticated people at the top. But what that happens over time is the monopolies, monopolies occur. And you look at Mexico, you know, there's only two or three really big, really big cartels. And it's the same, same model happens in, in any country at all. And what happens with the monopolies growing is that the wealth gets concentrated in fewer hands and that wealth corrupts the system. So for me, that's one of the most important things that will disappear because when you shrivel that black market, you remove the, the, the ability to corrupt the system. And of course, the most important, one of the other most important things is the fact that regulated products means that less people will die. So 
You know, it's, it, is, it is that simple. We, we will know what we can buy. I mean, so sometimes prohibitionists will argue with me and say, no, you, you don't talk about regulated things. We just need to educate our kids. <laughs> well, well that, that's ridiculous. I mean, even if you try to have a sensible education about dosage and uh, what not to mix other drugs with, you, you can't educate anyone because you don't know what you're educating about because you don't know what's in the drugs. You know, you, you have a pharmaceutical product, product in a in a chemist, there's someone who an adult can buy when they show photo ID. For example, MDMA, I understand that the, the perfect dose that might go in a pharmacy is 0 0.087. And, and that's, that would be the ideal starting point. You'd have very clear instructions and education about that. So those are just some of the, the few immediate benefits that I would see from regulation. Thank you very much to our speakers. Just before we finish um, tonight, uh, for the gentleman who has a friend who might have a case pending, uh, <laughs> the, you get both David's book and Neil's book. Unfortunately, Neil's book, um, al although it's a bestseller, it's almost sold out in South Africa, but is available here. David's book, uh, unfortunately, David had to bring over with him, and I thank him very much for that. And so we've got a few more copies of that. There were only six copies of Neil's book in South Africa available. And, uh, but they are available on the interweb thing, whatever it is. You can buy them there. So you get the two copies here, and uh, hopefully um, there'll be some advice there. Otherwise, give us a call. There we go. <laughs> the no, 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 they go to the question people, because they were brave enough and quick enough. There we go. There we go. Matt, there we go. You can choose to give yours away if you've got my copy already. And Mike West. There we go. Um, all right, so on Thursday night, we've got a slightly different lineup. Raquel will bring you in. So Raquel from uh, Uruguay and uh, was, was uh, very much part of making their, um, their, their laws around cannabis, which are very innovative. Um, we're going to have Ethan and Neil here again. David, unfortunately, will be in the High Court in South Africa talking about cannabis. But we will have the legendary Anand Grover. Now, if you haven't heard of him, go and Google him. Anand Grover was the man who um, fought the uh, laws against homosex homosexuality in India and, and uh, had it decriminalized. He then took on all the pharmaceutical companies uh, who refused to, to uh, allow their patents to be used for affordable ARVs, and he won that case. And it's because of him that we've got this large ARV program in South Africa to a large degree, and now he's taken on the cause of people who use drugs and is a commissioner on the Global Commissioner of Drugs. But also he was the UN rapporteur, special rapporteur on the rights to access to health uh, up until, I think, last year. And, and so he will be here as well. Um, it will be very exciting. We will continue this conversation. I think we'll, we'll actually start on the, on the legal regulation side of things. Um, so please join us for that, and, and remember to keep the conversation about drugs going, uh, and, and, and keep talking about it, because Judy Chang, who, who is the, the, the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, and, and uh, William Ibiti, who's, who's from uh, Nigeria, and myself on a radio station the other day, SAFM Africa, and... Um, the, the, the guy who was interviewing us actually cut the interview short. I'm pretty sure he did that because uh, he was just so astounded. What do you mean? Uh, 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 so this thing called drugs is a great evil. You must agree with it. Uh, well, actually, we don't. What? You know, and he was panic-stricken, and that's because it's not out there. Now, I understand the fears within our communities about drugs. I really do. I, I've worked in Lavender Hill, um, and, and I've seen some of the devastation. But at the end of the day, it's because of our policies that we are suffering this devastation. And we need to free our communities to be able to uh, overcome the inequity. And, and the worst thing about the war on drugs is it's actually a self-perpetuating method of oppressing people who are already oppressed to a large degree. And we need to overcome that. And we as South Africans with a constitution as our, as like ours, need to make sure our drug laws match our constitution. So please keep up the conversation. Come back when you can. Uh, and thank you for being here.